I'm Linda Elsigood, the founder of the LDN Research Trust, which has been a registered charity in the UK since 2004. We're here in Ireland to find out how LDN is being used here. So the history of LDN in my personal uh, guise was when a colleague of mine rang me up from a charity, an MS charity, and asked me had they ever heard of it, and I hadn't. So that's where the research started, and that brought me to New York and Dr. Bihari and um, several other proponents of the drug, um, people who were singing its praises. So I started to look more into it, and I thought there must be something in this because it's more than a few people and there seems to be a lot of positivity and the big thing to me was the fact that the drug was being used at less than one tenth of the proprietary tablet formulation strength so therefore the risks of toxicity or side effects are going to be reduced dramatically. So the process is that we would be prompted by a pharmacy uh, that we have already uh, literally met with and they've signed up for, to our uh, business to be able to buy low-dose naltrexone through our web shop, our web facility. That's a fully regulated environment, so it's a closed web shop. It cannot be accessed by patients. So the pharmacy would prompt us for an order. We would then ring back the pharmacy to see specific what specific uh, dose they want. Uh, it usually is in the order itself, and it will be a next-day delivery to every anywhere else in Ireland. So. The drug has a very minor effect and a very, very low and short period of time in the body, but the effects will be felt for quite some time. So the ramifications of what it does are significant and very, very interesting. And I don't think we've, we're only scratching the surface because now we're talking about intrinsic growth factors. We're talking about how it could, seems to help even eye problems. Uh, and I see, in fact, Stanford University are doing a lot of work on on its effect in um, all sorts of eye conditions, so who knows where it's going. It has never ceased to intrigue me and continues to do so. I'm Dr. Edmund O'Flaherty in Dublin and I have more than 500 patients for over 100 different conditions uh, uh, with using low-dose naltrexone. It is an amazing drug in many ways really. There's, I can't think of anything else in the same league of it that covers so many different conditions and have so little side effects and which is very cheap as well. Now that's a, a very rare sort of uh, situation in medicine to get all those things together. And the range of, of conditions that it can treat is phenomenal. It's well over 100 conditions and there are people coming to see me with, with rarities that I never heard of and they've come across it saying low dose naltrexone will work for this. You know, if nobody steps outside the box, nobody gets anything different, nobody discovers secondary uses for primary drugs um, and therefore people like myself who would have formulated it when others wouldn't do it and the doctors who prescribed it I think they're taking a risk but if they read up and educate themselves it's all about education in my view if you can inform yourself you needn't be afraid and this is why I'm not afraid of this drug and I wouldn't be afraid to take this drug I, I, I'd take a capsule now if I needed to or even just to prove that it was safe because I've informed myself that it's relatively innocuous and yet the effects of it can be so positive. Well, I, I went to see my doctor. I have a great GP. Love him to bits. He's, he's really supportive. He's great. And for a good while he was saying to me, Lynn, you know, I think you have fibromyalgia. And I was going, no, 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 I don't, I don't. I don't have enough pain. And then he said, well, do, you, do you think you're depressed? And I said, no, but if I keep feeling like this, I'm bloody well going to be yeah. depressed. So I, I've, he eventually got around me to go and see a rheumatologist um, who was very um, open to the diagnosis of fibromyalgia. And she, she said to me, you have fibromyalgia. And she pushed an information sheet towards me. And I just automatically leaned across and pushed it back towards her. <laughs> and she pushed it back to me and I pushed it back to her. And she said, what are you doing? You do have it. And I was like, oh, OK. So um, reluctantly, I accepted the diagnosis. And I went on um, 60 milligrams of Cymbalta. And I started to feel better. But gradually, it lost 
potency and efficacy, I think. And I ended up going to see a guy called uh, Dr. Joe Fitzgibbon. And with him, we looked at diet and um, he did every kind of allergy test. And uh, after a couple of months, he said to me, you know, he said, there's nothing wrong with you except one thing. He said, you need more medication. What you need is LDN. And that's how I came across it. So he first of all prescribed it to me and then I went back to my GP and I told him about it and he said, I've never heard of it, let me look into it. He looked into it and he said, listen, I have no problem prescribing that for you if it's working. Um, yeah, I've, uh, you know, we had that relationship yeah. of trust built already. Um, so he prescribed it. If it became available, on the medical card scheme and it is uh, in a limited way already there are quite a few patients with a long-term illness getting the drug as a an adjunct or sometimes as a, a standalone treatment and health boards have s at least uh, the great thing about the the healthcare service here is although there are rules they're quite flexible and in many cases uh, the health board official will say well it's not costing much and the pharmacist is willing to take responsibility and we have a consultant who's prescribed it. Well then, in that case, let's have a go. Let's see because, let's face it, the other option is a very expensive drug which requires six month reviews and can have all sorts of liver side effects and antibody side effects. So, in many cases, you do see people, get, people getting it. My experience with low-dose naltrexone uh, began when I went to a, a conference in Galway where there was a patient who had MS and he was uh, married to my sister's friend and he was very enthusiastic that he was taking this new medication of low-dose naltrexone and his MS symptoms had dramatically improved. So I attended the conference in, uh, with the general public at the time and uh, listened to his story very carefully and I was convinced that that had a real impact for him. And my main interest, I work as a fertility doctor, uh, I'm a family physician by training, but I've subspecialized into fertility treatment and I've been doing that for practically 20 years. But I remember thinking the next time one of my fertility patients comes into me uh, and they have something that is autoimmune, I would be very keen to try that low-dose naltrexone and see clinically does it help them to feel any better. Because my overall thinking is anything that will improve your general health should also improve your fertility. And as it turned out, it didn't take very long when I had a, a patient who came in, she had polycystic ovaries, she had endometriosis, she had a successful pregnancy with us, but we were really struggling to get it to work again, and her rheumatoid arthritis was all flaring up. So I said, you know, there's, there's a new treatment we could try for you with low-dose naltrexone. And I remember putting her on it and she had a very strong positive clinical reaction. Inflammation was reduced and uh, within two months she was pregnant. Now, it didn't occur to me at the time that the naltrexone may be having some direct effect on her fertility as well as helping with the autoimmune condition. Uh, so it was about, I don't know how much later before the next person came in who happened to have something autoimmune that I was ready to try that on again. And when I, when I saw a pattern emerging that they seemed to get pregnant quickly and successfully as a result of being on the naltrexone, then I began to think maybe we should try this for our infertile population as well. So especially in the world of infertility, we go through a process of clinical trial and error. And a lot of the time it's referred to as N plus one trials where you're aware of what the publications are that are out there and you say, I know what the publications are and I know there's no publication in this area, um, but I'm gonna try it on this individual patient and see for this person, does this treatment make a difference? And you can actually see the impact on a one by one basis and try and determine, does a new treatment seem to work for that individual patient you have? So that's the kind of principle I was following. Um, and Eventually, I found that it's a very effective treatment for endometriosis. So women who would come in very painful periods and horrible premenstrual symptoms, the week before the period begins, they would feel very unwell. Um, and I found if I put them on naltrexone, period pain dramatically reduced. 
uh, premenstrual symptoms dramatically improved, energy levels came up throughout the entire month, and we found pregnancies occurred more quickly. One of my early patients was a young man uh, who was, uh, had Crohn's disease, which is a horrible bowel condition where you bleed every day and have, have horrific pain. So he had been uh, bleeding for 10 years and had been seen by consultants all over the place. And th nothing could be done for him. It just didn't work. And I put him on low-dose naltrexone, and 12 years later, he's never had a bleed since. Now, I did send him to see a consultant two or three years ago to check that the bowel is okay, and the answer was quiescent Crohn's. In other words, if he stops the low-dose naltrexone, it, it'll start again. Um, and then with ongoing clinical experience, we discovered um, these women, unfortunately, a lot of them are getting miscarriages because initially we were afraid to give naltrexone during pregnancy. So our take on it was, we don't know enough about this, we should stop it during pregnancy. And we saw so many miscarriages, we eventually figured, you know what, I bet it's because we're stopping the naltrexone, inflammation is coming back and it's putting the pregnancies at risk. So we tried to get as much evidence as we could at the time, uh, as well as clinical experience from doctors in the States. And our take on it at the time was, at the very least, naltrexone at a dose of up to 100 milligrams seems not to cause any harm during pregnancy. Um, and we said, well, if it's not doing any harm, let's continue it and see if it might do some good. And wh when we found clinically giving it during pregnancy, we found the miscarriage rate dramatically improved for us. The main causes I come across, however, would be uh, chronic pain in, in all shapes and forms. And uh, the, the main one that I happen to see is fibromyalgia. Now, fibromyalgia is a really nasty kind of pain. Uh, there's no relief at all. It's, it's just the whole body is on fire, basically. And that's horrific. And it, for some reason, it's nearly always the women have it. I, I, it's very rare to have a man having a fibromyalgia. Or if they do, they don't come to me. Uh, the thing is then that the, the pain level, I, I asked them, what's the pain level out of 10? And they often say 8 to 12 or something like that. It's overwhelming. And uh, after a few weeks, the pain gets down to a low level, maybe somewhere between 2 and 4. At that level, they feel they're in heaven. And it's such a be beneficial treatment for their condition there. So I have more than 50 patients with fibromyalgia from all over Ireland and from some other countries as well. And uh, it's, it's very nice to see that the, the way they can, their life has been changed so easily. Products don't change that quickly in a pharmacy environment, you know, a pharmacist, pharmaceutical environment. It's, it's a tablet, no, so that's why it's unlicensed. It's a very simple process. If you change a tablet in any way, that's when it becomes unlicensed. It's just a, a little technical, but the government have facilitated the use of medicines like this, whether it be on, because we're a small population, you know, not all medicine, medicines can be licensed because it's expensive. It wouldn't be, could it be a small cohort of patients? Or it could be a new medication that they haven't, the company hasn't gone to license yet, or it could happen in two years' time. Now, the difficulty we have is where are the publications? I'm more of a clinician rather than a researcher, but I'm developing more into researcher and trying to get publications. So the next thing we really badly need to do is to get publications to say that what we've observed clinically, we can now demonstrate to our peers through publications that this is a reasonable thing to try. And the word is spreading bit by bit, I must say. Every week I get, uh, over, over any month or over a year, there'd be more and more people coming along. And uh, when I see patients, say, from the, down the country here, I tell them, talk to your GP and see what he start using it. And that's happening quite a lot around the country now. I got a very nice phone call from County Cork. <coughs> nearly about 200 miles from here about a week ago. And he said, I'm not coming back to you anymore, he said. Uh, but you, thank you very much for, for setting me on that low dose naltrexone. My own doctor is, will give it to me now. But he said, it, it was wonderful what you did for me. And uh, thank you very much. The, what I would like to encourage to, do, to doctors is to say, well, um, first, do no harm. Stick with the principle of primum non nocere. And what I can say from my experience of 15 years of using low-dose naltrexone is this is a safe treatment. I give it to women during pregnancy and we don't see any damage to the embryos. We see fewer miscarriages. And if anything, when I see the parents coming back trying for baby number two, 
they bring their child with them and we look at the child, they're bright eyed, they're intelligent, they're hitting their developmental milestones. If anything, they're, they're at least as good, if not better than their non LDN exposed peers. And I tried to gather some research on this. We looked at 120 pregnancies with low dose naltrexone, 120 pregnancies without it, and we found no increased incidence of any adverse effects. But to prove safety, you need thousands and thousands of pregnancies. So it's going to be some time before we can definitively say it's absolutely safe. But what we observed was when the children were born, those that had naltrexone during pregnancy needed far fewer antibiotics in the first year of life compared to uh, those who weren't on naltrexone. It's like their immune systems were better. We couldn't demonstrate or prove any intellectual uh, uh, superiority or uh, better developmental milestones, but generally what I've seen is they're good eaters, they're good sleepers, they don't get sick as often, and I think it's because uh, when mum's endorphins are boost during pregnancy, mum feels well, uh, that's transmitted to baby, the immune system is, is stronger and uh, we see healthy babies with it. So my take is, well, if it doesn't seem to harm a baby and it may be positively beneficial for babies, there's very few medications you can safely give during pregnancy. Well, I think we can be confident that this doesn't do any harm. Because it's a cheap drug, not being promoted by any drug company, it's hard to get it out. If the doctors could do it and learn all about it, for example, and the sort of work you're doing, for, for example, bit by bit it spreads around from person to person. But there's nobody putting be that in the British Medical Journal. By the way, I looked up recently, uh, a few months ago, how many, uh, how many mentions of low-dose naltrexone in the British Medical Journal? There were only three mentions there. And uh, that's just incredible. When I started prescribing it for MS, there were my first cases. And uh, my feeling was that it stopped the progress of it didn't reverse it or anything like that, well, it's, but it did help, in most cases that I could see, stop the progress of it. So that was very useful, you know. Um, so if I'm comparing this, uh, say somebody comes in to me and they have an autoimmune condition of any sort. So I've observed fibromyalgia, rheumatoid arthritis, multiple cirrhosis, uh, lupus, just to name a few, and if, if the patient comes in and they're told the next step is we need to try immunosuppressive medications because your autoimmune condition is quite problematic. Well, I know straight away there's a list of side effects with immunosuppressive medications that can do harm. Relative to low-dose naltrexone, naltrexone has far fewer side effects. What hasn't been proven to the satisfaction of the general medical community is does it do any good? Now clinically, my experience would be between seven or eight out of every 10 patients with an autoimmune condition seem to respond positively. So what we need to do is get published data to prove that. But from a very simple perspective, from my N of one trial, if a patient comes into me and they say they would like to try this, I'll put up my hand and say, I'm not an expert neurologist, I am not, uh, a rheumatologist, I am uh, not a gastroenterologist, I really uh, am not an expert in a lot of the autoimmune conditions, but I have great experience using naltrexone, I know it won't do you any harm and we can try it and you tell me, do you feel the same, do you feel better, do you feel worse? And if you try it for the best part of three, four, five weeks, then you'll be able to know yourself, is this something that's helping your autoimmune condition or not? So my take to my fellow physicians would be not to be put off that this is a off-label use uh, for a licensed medication. So the good thing is naltrexone is licensed and it's, it's uh, available and any doctor anywhere who has a medical license can prescribe it. But it's just unusual to use this really low dose. We're using less than one-tenth of the official licensed dose that has been proven to be safe, no harm to liver, kidneys, or general health, and no restriction on how long somebody can use it at the 50 milligram dose. Uh, now granted, it's for a very unusual condition of we're treating opioid dependence or alcohol dependence and trying to help people with that. Uh, but if we're going to use less than one-tenth of that dose, we can be confident we're not doing any harm, so long as we're straight with our patients and say, this is off-label use, 
there, there aren't enough clinical trials to definitively prove this, but if you want to try something that won't do any harm and may do some good, we can try this. I think there's a resistance. Both in, there, We know there's a resistance to prescribing it, and that comes from caution. That comes from caution invoked by insurance companies and solicitors who advise doctors not to prescribe anything, and then the patient's perfectly safe. But of course, people are ill and in need of treatment and want to try something that they feel is relatively safe. Um, so I think we need to encourage doctors to have a little bit of confidence in trying it. To do that, they have to trust the pharmacist, the drug, and the patient. Um, they have to be sure that none of them are going to come back to them and say, look what you just did. And I think that's where my job comes in. I think if someone asks me, I'll give them an honest answer. I'll use the data I have available, but uh, the knowledge as well, because our knowledge depends on reading up on drugs, seeing the way they work, the toxicity, the potential for interaction as well as side effects, because interactions are a key one, you know, that many people are already on multiple drugs for the conditions that tend to be chronic. Um, th that we see taking the drug. So we have a resistance. There's a second resistance as well, and it partly goes back to price, but it also goes back to formulation. One of the things that I've often thought about as well with regard to endometriosis is a very common treatment for endometriosis is the hormonal contraceptive pill. So a woman comes in uh, at any age and uh, she has very painful periods there can be a clinical suspicion this woman may have endometriosis and she's put on the pill to control her period pain. The pill is not licensed for that. So it's off-label use uh, of uh, the birth control pill to use it to treat uh, period pain or endometriosis. Um, so, so that gives me a degree of comfort to say, well, that's widely used and widely practiced. But what I've observed when I give uh, low dose naltrexone, we can get very strong positive clinical effects, reducing inflammation, reducing period pain, and I find it superior to hormonal contraception. But it's better for my patients because most of them are trying to get pregnant, so there's little point putting them on the pill anyway. I mean, it's safe. As I say, it's safer than low dose aspirin, where it's prescribing for half the country, as I say. Uh, but they don't know about it. This is the problem. I mean, people come to me, as I say, from all over the country, and they would go back to their own doctor and, and they'd say, well, will you prescribe this? I, they've taken it for a month or two. And he, he didn't know anything about it because it's not... The big companies control all the uh, newspaper, medical newspaper and media. And so you don't ever see any reference to it. So I gave a presentation on low-dose naltrexone in the United States, I think about five years ago. And uh, I was asked to give a presentation on the published evidence in favor of low-dose naltrexone. So um, at the time I thought to myself, well, that's gonna be a very short presentation. But to my delight, when I did a, a search on it, I found that there were um, nearly 100 publications on low-dose naltrexone. So the, the published evidence base for naltrexone is increasing all the time, and there's more and more growing experience. Um, the difficulty with regard to publications and low-dose naltrexone is that there is no profit motive behind it, and it is the thing that drives a lot of publications today. If a pharmaceutical company has the capacity to make a profit out of funding a, a research trial, then the trial gets funded, the research gets completed, and the data is made available. But because there's no profit motive from low-dose naltrexone, there's little funding to do it, and it's self-motivated, more altruistic physicians that tend to take this on. One of the most interesting and best publications that I've seen was by Professor Jill Smith using low-dose naltrexone for, for Crohn's disease. And she published phase one and phase two clinical trials she had um, very good evidence to show the anti-inflammatory effect in resistant uh, uh, Crohn's disease patients, and she was able to demonstrate how effective it was reducing inflammation and healing Crohn's. And that's published in peer-reviewed uh, journals, and it's uh, placebo-controlled clinical trials. So that's very convincing, because that's as good as your evidence gets. Um, so it definitely works for inflammatory bowel disease for Crohn's, 
Um, and the issue is the immune system isn't really selective. It may attack your bowel, it may attack your joints, it may attack your nerves, but it's calming down the immune system for all these autoimmune conditions. If it works for one autoimmune condition, it'll very commonly work for others as well. So data like that gives me a higher degree of confidence to say it's a very reasonable immune modifying treatment to recommend for people with any pr pro-inflammatory autoimmune condition. Um, but the fact is, I couldn't fix myself and the doctors couldn't fix me either until LDN came along and LDN did fix me. Um, now I work as hard as I want. Um, I, I, I have the motto that I, I work to live, I don't live to work um, because that's what I advocate to my clients too. So it's a nice balance um, but I, I run, I go to the gym, I cook, I see friends, I, I have a really good life and I, I never have to say, I never have to compromise anymore. If I want to do something I can do it and there is no repercussion, there is no slap down the next day and I can wake up every day and know it's going to be a good day and with fibromyalgia you can't do that. It, you open your eyes and regardless of what you do, you could be in a flare-up and it's through no fault of your own. But so with LDN now, I, I don't flare up. You know, I used to flare up more than I was normal. And now I'm just consistently normal again. And it's a great place to be. Uh, the great thing about low-dose naltrexone is that it's, it's low cost. So it can be obtained for as little as 30 or 40 euro for a month's supply. Um, so the cost savings to the individual who has to pay for their own medications or ultimately the cost saving to the state is potentially enormous because many immune modifying medications uh, can be extremely expensive over a thousand euro for a month's supply. The other issue is if you take out your immune system with immunosuppressive medication, you're exposing yourself to increased risk of other autoimmune conditions and potentially even increased lifetime risk of developing cancers. Remarkably, naltrexone will reduce the risk of other autoimmune conditions and possibly reduce the risk of developing other cancers as well. So that's a very attractive reason to prescribe it, even though the evidence still has to come in for that. Uh, deductive reasoning would say it's, it's a reasonable thing to consider. Mm. So I've seen patients that have long-term illnesses that are on naltrexone on a long-term basis. Um, I guess the one thing as well I'd want to say about naltrexone is that it's not a guaranteed um, uh, cure for every autoimmune condition. There are people who are non-responders and the clinician and the patient taking it need to be cognizant of that. Uh, I remember I had a patient with rheumatoid arthritis that responded beautifully to low-dose naltrexone for six full years and then she went through a period of significant abnormal stress and I've seen it clinically when there's a major stress around temporarily the naltrexone doesn't work. Now the problem with my patient was she never contacted me and her naltrexone stopped working because she, her house flooded basically and it was a major, major trauma and stress at the time. So due to that and all the distress that went with it, despite continuing her medication, it was rendered ineffective. And any doc who's prescribed naltrexone would be well aware of this effect. My advice to people is, if you're getting a flare up like that, get in contact with your physician because we do not want uh, the autoimmune condition to flare up. Go for something strongly immunosuppressive like steroids in the short term. Get to your neurologist, get to your rheumatologist and get on something to suppress your immune system at that time. Sadly, she didn't do that and she got tr tremendous damage to her joints that she still has to this day. Um, so for me, the naltrexone was, was successful and effective, but when the need came for her to take immunosuppressive medications, she missed that opportunity and she should still have taken them. So I think the important thing for physicians is not to fall into the trap to say, Low-dose naltrexone is always the solution for everybody all of the time. Use the immunosuppressive medications when you need to. Work with your specialist, rheumatologist, neurologist, whoever you need to, 
and look at a case of let's do both one and the other and let's do the best we can for the patient. I've learned that LDN can be prescribed in Ireland if the prescriber thinks it's of benefit and in some cases on the national card. Further clinical trials and studies are needed for LDN to become mainstream. In the meantime, we hope the medical profession will look at the research already out there and prescribe it for their patients where applicable.